For those of you joining us uh, via the internet through the Facebook Live, um, welcome. Welcome those here in the sanctuary. If you're on Facebook, leave a comment. Um, just say hi so we know you were here and where you're from. I'm able to see how many, but I don't get to see where you're from unless you leave a comment. So do that. Please. I've titled today's message, Free Gift. And I trust that there's somebody in, in, listening or in the congregation here that despises the term free gift as much as I do. It's redundant. I don't like the term free gift. You know, they use it in advertising all the time. If it costs me something, then it's not a gift. And if it's free, if it's a gift, then I don't have to say it's free because that's just the way things are. But that's just me. The translators of many of our versions of scripture use the phrase free gift in the passage we're going to be using this morning. And that's because they didn't, uh, that's the way they translated the word charisma. There's another word for gift that's also used in the beginning, dorea, uh, and it's just translated gift. But charisma, I think, would be better translated as a gracious gift, because it's from charisma that we get the idea of grace. And so it's a gracious gift, but, you know, no big deal. Just know that I titled it something that I personally don't like, but that's what's in the scripture reading for today. So anyway, last week we jumped right into the middle of Paul's theological teaching in the book of Romans. The first 11 chapters of Romans is his theology. It, it presents his revelation of the gospel. Then chapters 12 through 16 applies that, uh, applies the revelation. Now, in, in his discourse, in um, the first 11 chapters, and specifically in this area where, where we're in, he uses a technique that's called dialectical logic. And what that is, is he presents differing views, sometimes contradictory views, as they oppose one another, and then brings them together in a synthesis, showing how what the conclusion is as a result of that. Now, if we don't get that, if we don't see that, we can come up with some pretty strange ideas from some of his teaching in Romans. So the last time, we looked at the first half of chapter 5, and I didn't go into any detail on the entire thought that was presented in the chapter, uh, mainly, I just brought out the truth that God's not mad at you or anyone else. Hopefully, you did some thinking on that. Now, for some of you, that, that may not be a new concept, but I think for others of you, it probably is a new concept that God's not mad at us. This week, we'll continue to delve into this line of reasoning from Paul as we finish up chapter 5. So let's begin in chapter 5 and verse 12, and we'll go through verse 21. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 12. <clears throat> Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for indeed sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, 
much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Powerful passage of scripture. I hope that you can see how Paul is presenting an argument here by using comparison and contrast. He contrasts what Adam did and what Jesus did. In fact, he says in verse 14 that Adam was a type of Jesus. In verse 14 there, the last part, it says, Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. <clears throat> now, I trust you understand about types and shadows in the Bible. The traditional under the traditional interpretation of a type involves seeing a historical person, place, event, or institution as having a future historical fulfillment. So in this case, Adam, a historical person, had a future fulfillment in Jesus. We can see this plainly from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 45, where it says, Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Jesus is referred to as the last Adam, not the second Adam. Not one in a series, but the last. Now, that'll be important in weeks to come as we look at Paul's gospel. I'm assuming you've heard of the federal headship of Adam. The federal headship of Adam. How that, what he did, what that means is that what he did passed on to all humanity. Okay? So that's what Paul's referring to here in this section. Adam's transgression was passed on to all human beings regardless of race or religion. So that makes him the federal head of that which is termed in, the, in some churches, the original sin uh, is passed on to everyone, but Adam is the federal headship of that. However, that's not the end of the story, glory to God. There is another federal headship which is found in Christ. And that is what Paul is contrasting in this passage. What Adam did and what Christ did and the effects of each. So let's take a look at this passage. Let's take it apart piece by piece so that we can see the beauty of what Christ has done for us. Beginning in verse 12, it says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Sin was introduced through Adam. And as God had promised, death entered at the same time. Notice that the verse says death spread to all men. There was a pandemic of death, if you will. It started with one person and spread throughout the entire human race. Now the last phrase in that passage, spread to all men because all sin, should remind you of Romans 3.23, which says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Should be one that's in your memory bank. Now Paul made this statement, there in chapter 3 of course, made that statement early on in his argument. And this was the result of showing that Everyone, Jews, Gentiles, and any other type of religiousness were guilty of sin. 
There was no excuse. Whether they had the law given by Moses, or whether they only had an inkling of God by looking at creation, or if they worshipped a multitude of gods, it didn't matter. Everyone came under that aspect. All had sinned. And all earned the benefits of their sin. That he states in Romans chapter 6, which we haven't gotten there yet, and the wages of sin is death. Notice that he used the term wages, which is something you earn. You work for wages. You do nothing for a gift. And Paul is trying to get us to understand the reality of this gift that we have been given. We haven't earned it. We did nothing for it. Now, I know that the wheels are turning. For many, they'll say, yes, but you have to receive it. Well, that yes, but, as I've said before, is uh, only means that they don't believe what's being said. And usually that response is given as a retort to some plain truth of Scripture, which is too hard for us to wrap our legalistic tit-for-tat minds around. Uh, I've got one favorite that has yet to fail me. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48, the Scripture says, You shall be therefore perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. And it doesn't matter. All I have to do is read that verse of Scripture. And someone's going to say, yes, but nobody's perfect. They don't even know what I'm going to talk about. But we have to get that first thing out there. To, and when you think about it, we're trying to contradict the Word of God. I'm not sure that's the side I want to be on, where I contradict what God is saying. I had somebody recently do that to me this week. Um, I quoted a verse of scripture out of Galatians, and they said, we're not allowed to, it, it's not right to say there is no male or female. Well, that's what the scripture says. Okay. And it was a believer. But that's where people go. Now, they'll say you have to receive it. You have to extend your hand, as it were, to receive a gift. And that's the usual analogy that I hear. You've got to receive it. So I can relate it a little bit to modern terms. Have any of you, do any of you use direct deposit in your bank? A lot of you use, yeah, use direct deposit. Okay, now it's a weak analogy, okay? But the money does not pass through your hands. It's directly deposited into your bank account. And of course, you're thinking, um, well, I had to do something to earn that. Yeah, that's true. But like I said, it's a weak analogy. But the point is, it's being put into your account without passing through your hands. But let's take a look at the idea of receive as presented in the Bible in another place and what I'm trying to show you. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 11, the scripture says, By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age. So I have a question for you. What did Sarah do to receive that ability? Did she start going to the gym and working out to strengthen her womb? Did she start taking herbal supplements? No. She did absolutely nothing. She received that power, and that word receive is the exact same word. It was, if I can say it this way, it was direct deposited into her account to receive the strength. It's the same word that's used here in our passage in verse 17 that says, For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. It's the exact same word, and it is the exact same concept. Now, because of our misunderstanding of that word receive, we miss the intent of the passage. If it wasn't for that misunderstanding, there would be no concept whatsoever of our involvement. Nowhere in this passage that I've read 
through these verses, is there anything required of you to do? It's not there. It's all of God. There's nothing we can do to earn this. It is a free gift that has been direct deposited into your account. There's no indication anywhere that you can do or have to do anything. And yet, that is what we have made the gospel to be. God will go second if you'll go first. You have to ask, and then God will respond. We've made that to be the gospel. But that's not what it says in this passage, is it? It's not in this passage. And there's other passages like it in Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, and Colossians. So let's look a little more closely at Paul's logic of comparison in this passage. He says in verse 15, But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Now, this is a verse that folks a lot of times use to justify why we don't see the full aspect of the gospel in operation. They see that the grace only abounded for many. Okay, let me ask you a question here. Paul uses the word many for the result of Adam's trespass. If many died through one man's trespass. So how many is that? How many is the many? Is it all? All of humanity, isn't it? Okay. Now he's using logic here. He's comparing... So everyone was affected by that trespass. We know and believe that it's all. Everyone was affected by Adam's sin. Therefore, what are the mental gymnastics required of us to change that same word when it comes to what Jesus did to not everybody? Much more, much more, it says, okay, how much more the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. The exact same many that were affected by Adam are affected by Christ, and yet our interpretation is, is that last many is a few. Not everybody. Is it creating any kind of a cognitive dissonance for some of you? For what we've been taught all our lives? That one many is different from the other many in the same verse? How did we end up with it being only a select few? Because of our theology, it's a filter. Our, our presupposed theology is a filter through which we interpret verses. Our religious leaders have taught us. Now, many of our religious leaders have encouraged us to use a literal interpretation of the Bible. But when it comes to a verse like this, reading, reading it for what it says is no longer possible. Because our, it doesn't fit our narrative. That's a phrase that's being used quite a bit these days. It has to go along with the narrative. We have to change it to fit our narrative. But as I said, I don't want to fall into that crowd. However, Paul goes on to leave us no doubt as to his meaning in verse 18. Right now it sounds like this is just Hill interpreting scripture for you. But if we go to verse 18, we can see what Paul said. He explains it. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, we've already agreed on that, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. He makes it plain. And it's the same phrase. The all men that's in condemnation is the same all men in justification. That's powerful. 
It's going to knock us off center where we've been for a long time. It probably is trying to unwrap your mind a little bit. But it's the same. Now, for those of you that may be wondering, the word men there is anthropos, which is all humanity. Okay, so you ladies are included too in this. It's not just the boys. When Jesus was about to die, the last thing he said was, it is finished. In his one act, he declared that you have been made righteous in him. What Adam did, Jesus undid. What Adam tainted, Jesus sainted. We say it that way. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, it says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He became our sin and we became his rightness. He became our darkness and we became his light. He became our failure and we became his success. Glory to God. And I explained to you a few weeks ago this phrase at the end, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's not declaring a possibility. He's not making it a possibility that we may become the righteousness of God. The way that is structured in the Greek syntax with the subjunctive, I explained all that stuff to you, not going into it again, but it's a done deal. It's a done deal. In him, we are the righteousness of God. So what I want you to see this morning, friends, is that your salvation is not dependent on your getting it right at any level. It's not dependent on whether you walk the aisle in an, at an evangelistic meeting. It's not dependent on whether you prayed the sinner's prayer. It's not dependent on whether you repented with tears and loud crying or the myriad other things that have been added to the gospel of God's grace. As I mentioned a couple of months ago, any one of those things can creep back into your mind and cause doubt as to, did I do it right? Did I pray hard enough? Did I say the right words? Did I cry correctly? Was that a right church for me to walk down the aisle? Anything can come in and be used to minister doubt to you about your salvation. But when you discover that it's all of God, it's all by Him, it's by Him alone, the sovereign creator of the universe, rest assured. Rest assured. It is done. It is finished. You have been saved. You have been born again. You have been regenerated, given new life, all by the free and loving gift of grace by your heavenly Father who loves you passionately. He did what we were absolutely unable to do. We could not do any of it. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Unable to perceive, understand, or receive the things of God until He brought the change in your life. Your only response, your only response is to say thank you. That's all you're left with. Thank you. Let's pray. Glorious Father, we thank you for your unconditional love. Thank you for showing us just how great your love is by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Lord God, we thank you for the precious gift of eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. We'll praise your name forever and ever, for you have all wisdom and power. We put our hope in you, Lord. 
You are our help and our shield. Our hearts rejoice in you, for we trust in your holy name. Father, you have performed many wonders for us. Your plans for us are too numerous to list. You have no equal. If we tried to recite all your wonderful deeds, we would never come to the end of them. Just thinking about all that you have done in grace towards us humbles us. Thank you is certainly insufficient to express our complete gratitude but I ask that you receive our humble offering in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.